I was told I had to wear it anyway, so I will. Um, your homework should be up here. Jonathan will be here imminently to pick it up. I don't know where he is right now. Um, I put up this, you know, we only have three classes left, right? Today's Thursday, so we have class today, and we have class Tuesday, and we have class Wednesday, and that's it. And the projects are due Wednesday. And I just put this up so you could understand that the projects are not insignificant amount of the grade. I mean, I don't know if you, you need to be motivated that way. I'm not sure. <laughs> but it is 10% of the grade, OK? So it's almost, it's almost as much as all the homeworks combined, modulo 5%. OK. So um, I, I suggest you not spend the, until the very last moment doing it, OK? So I think when I gave the assignment, you, you see there's three projects you can choose from. And I gave you some idea of what I wanted in a report, right? There should be a little report written. It should be a little different than a homework. You should like introduce the problem and I, I tell you what I want, okay? So what I'm encouraging you is don't wait till the last minute. Based on the emails I got last night, I sensed Jonathan was getting emails like a lot of emails at the last minute. <laughs> he's a little, little, he's a little more conciliatory than, than maybe some of the other TAs, but his, um, <laughs> his approach seemed to be pretty much the same. Leave me alone, okay? So, um, all right. So there it is. So I'm going to pick up where I left off last time, which is not that. No, I don't want that. Um, and I'm going to start cutting maybe a few corners and leaving a little of material out so I can get to the material I think is most important. Um, so if I do leave something out, that's, that's telling you that I don't think that's the most significant thing. Um, and especially if I leave it out of the lecture and you don't have a homework problem on it, that makes it pretty unlikely I'll put it on an exam. Right, because that probably wouldn't be that fair. All right, so one of the things, this was the lecture I started God knows when, because I don't know. It was the last time I talked. I guess that was last Thursday. And so we're talking about um, s uh, stability of systems of, of differential equations in time. And we already discussed this problem. If I give you a set, let me make sure I use the same notation. Well, let me just say this. I'll cover this real quickly and review what we did, which was topic number one. Okay? Today, um, I'm going to introduce topic two and topic three. And we're going to skip the big example at the end, because the big example at the end takes like a half hour. Um, so and I'll explain the implications of, of skipping the example in terms of what I expect you to know. So you might recall that I can't review this in its totality. But I said, if we had a system of linear differential equations that look like that, OK? So you know, dy, dt, y is a vector, of course. A is a matrix, square matrix. So if you have a set of differential equations that look like that, stability of the system, in other words, whether y goes to a steady state, in this case it'd be 0, or goes off to infinity or oscillates, and the oscillations grow and things like this. Uh, you have to go back and look at exactly what I define to be stability. Um, it's dependent completely on the, the eigenvalues of this matrix A. And so you can take the eigenvalues, which in principle can have a real part and imaginary part, and pl plot them in this plane here. Okay. And so if they're over here, this part over here is stable. So it doesn't matter what the imaginary part of the eigenvalue is, just the real part. If the real part's negative, all the, all the eigenvalues, right? So the eigenvalues of the matrix A, right, you can have like lambda 1 up to lambda n, n of them. If all these eigenvalues have real part that are negative, the system is stable. If any of the eigenvalues are over here, they have positive real part, the system is unstable. Okay? Yeah. And it gets a little more complex when you have eigenvalues along the axis here, have no real part. We didn't really focus on that too much. Okay? So that, that's what we covered last time. It took us a little while to get there, but that was the basic idea. Okay? All right, so that's great in the sense that if the system is linear, the stability of this linear set of differential equations is totally determined by the properties of the matrix A. But what if the system is not linear? In other words, you have something that looks maybe like this. So on the right-hand side is some nonlinear function, right? It, this, is a, this is a system of equations, so this will be a vector function, right? Um, what if that function over there on the right-hand side is not linear? Then, then you can't do this because <laughs> it's not linear. This only applies if the right-hand side is linear. So what we're going to do is something called linearization. So we're going to approximate this system by a set of linear differential equations. 
and by doing something we can make some conclusions, not complete set, about the stability of this system by an approximation of that that looks pretty much like this. Okay? So the first thing I have to tell you is how to approximate this system, that's so-called linearization, okay? And then I have to tell you, once you do that, what, you, what can you conclude about the stability, okay? So the first slide here is just um, summarizing the basic concepts here. So this idea of linear system stability, which is this, can be extended to this set of equations, nonlinear differential equations if, through this process of linearization. First thing you have to do is find the steady states, okay? Because for an, so for a system like this, if the system is stable, and the system has more than one steady state, all the steady states are stable, okay? It's not dependent on which steady state you're talking about. I hope you realize the steady state would be any sets of y's that satisfy that equation. There might be, obviously y bar equal zero is one of them, but there might be more, depending on the rank of the matrix A. But stability is totally independent of which steady state you're talking about if the system's linear. But that's not true if the system is nonlinear. So the first thing you have to do is find the steady states. Find the y bars that satisfy that. In MATLAB, we do that using f solve or f0. Okay? All right. Once you find a steady state, you can linearize this set of nonlinear differential equations about that steady state using a Taylor series expansion, which I'll show you. Okay? That's an approximation. Once you have that linearized system, then you can conclude something about the stability of the original nonlinear system from the eigenvalues of this linearized system we're going to get that I'm going to show you how we get. Okay? Um, the, the penalty you pay for the system being nonlinear is that the result you're going to get is always so-called local, meaning you can, if the steady state's stable, you can assure it's stable near that steady state. In other words, if you start near there, it'll stay there, but you don't know how near that is. Okay? So what used to be results that were global, when it's linear, will now become local because it's nonlinear. Okay? All right. And that's the point I mentioned here. Okay? Because this linearization is only going to be, because we're going to do a Taylor series expansion about the equilibrium point or steady state point, the approximation is only good near that point. So you can only make conclusions if you're near that point. Um, and then if you have, let's say, um, 10 steady states, which is a little bit much, but if you did, you'd have to repeat the process 10 times, one for each steady state. Okay? Um, and an example you did that Jonathan gave you an email last night saying what washout meant and what non-trivial meant. Okay, that's a system that has two steady states. One is the so-called washout or trivial steady state. That's where you put in substrate and the substrate comes back out and no cells grow. It's not of much practical interest. It can occur, you want to avoid it. And the other one is where you actually s you make cells and cells make product. That's the non-trivial. So it actually has two steady states, okay? And that was much like the example I was going to do, but I'm going to skip that example and then I'll explain why. Okay. All right, so let's say you have this, let's, say, let's start with a single differential equation to make life easy for ourselves. So y is a scalar, and so that means f is a scalar function of y. We're not going to worry about the right-hand side depending on t, because they rarely do. It doesn't make any difference anyway. Steady state is any, any, any value of y that satisfies this equation, right? It's the derivative equal to zero. It doesn't change with time. And since instead of denoting y depending on t, if y does not depend on t, we put a bar over it. It means a steady state value. It doesn't change with time, okay? So we, we, so we find solutions to this equation. There might be more than one. It just depends on the nature of the function f, right? And you can't, you can't find them until I give you the function f. So here he comes, and there he goes. <laughs> See? It's very efficient. He also looks a little bit scared, so. <laughs> you always have one rogue student, you know? <laughs> All right. It's a MATLAB homework. What can you really be doing in the crowd at this point? You know? But oh well. All right. So solve this equation for the steady states. Call the steady state y bar. There might be more than one, okay? But let's just focus on one steady state y bar. Hopefully you remember the Taylor series expansion of a function. You should have covered this in calculus of the first semester of calculus when you were here, or maybe even in high school, I don't know. Okay. You, you remember the Taylor series expansion of a function? So what I'm going to do is perform a Taylor series expansion of this function f of y about the point y bar. Okay? And so if you remember the Taylor series expansion, the first term is evaluate the function at the point of interest where you're doing the expansion. In this case, it's y bar. Okay? Then you have the derivative of the function f with respect to y. That's another function, right? 
called the derivative. I, I shouldn't take the partial. I love partials. There's, it, you know the difference between a partial and a I mean, there's only one variable here, so you don't need a partial derivative. It should be just d, whatever. Okay. So you take the derivative of this function f with respect to y. That's another function. You evaluate that at y bar. Okay. Once you do that, that'll give you some number, you'll see in an example. And then you multiply that times y minus y bar. That's the second term in the Taylor series expansion. You should remember the third term, which we're neglecting, all higher order terms looks like this. 1 over 2 factorial. Then that, I'll correct my nomenclature here. Take the second derivative of f with respect to y squared. Evaluate that at the point y bar. Multiply that times y minus y bar squared. This is an infinite series, right? So um, obviously, we can't keep all terms. We truncate it at this after the second term, because this, this right-hand side now will be linear in y. Like, if we kept the next term, it'd be nonlinear in y. And our whole goal is to make the model linear. <laughs> so we wouldn't want to do that. OK. I have this symbol here, which I'm sure you know. That means this is an approximation, right? So this isn't exactly what this, what this function is. It's an approximation of it. OK? All right. Now, by definition, the function evaluated at y bar is 0, right? Because that's a steady state. So that term's going to drop out. And you're going to be left with this. OK? All right. Now we can introduce this, which we've done before. Right? I'm going to introduce a variable called y prime, and that's going to be the difference between y and the steady state value. We, you've seen this before in a different context. You've seen this in a context of non-homogeneous linear differential equations. Okay. So I'm going to define, whoops, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to define y prime to be equal to y minus y bar, and then I'm going to be able to rewrite this equation like this. Because first of all, the derivative of y and y prime are the same thing, right? Because they only differ by a constant. So I can just put y prime here. Okay? That term dropped off, so I'm left with this. Once you evaluate this function, so you find this derivative. That's a function of y. You evaluate this at y bar. That's going to become some number. I'm calling that number a, just because I want to. Okay. And then if you look at what this is, this is y minus y bar. That's what I called y prime. Okay. So you took what was a nonlinear differential equation like that, and now you have a linear differential equation that looks like that. Okay? It's an approximation. Right? This is, this is not the exact same as this. This is a good approximation if y is near y bar, because that's how the Taylor series works. Okay. So that's called linearization. All right? So let's see how it works on a little toy example here. So let's say I gave you this equation. Let's not even worry about it. It comes from a reactor problem, but let's just say I gave it to you. So it's an equation that comes from a component balance on a reactor, and it's a single equation. It's a nonlinear function of the dependent variable CA. Okay? Why is it nonlinear? It's nonlinear because there's a squared there. Okay, so this function on the right hand side is f of ca. So the first thing I have to do to apply this method is I have to find the steady state or steady states of that problem. So to do that, I'm giving you these parameter values volumetric flow rate, volume of the reactor, inlet concentration, reaction rate constant. Okay, set this derivative equal to zero, and then so that's what I've done here. I've called the whole right-hand side f of ca. And then if I set the derivative equal to 0, I call the corresponding va steady state value ca of r, which is this function here. Plug in all the parameter values and call ca, ca of r. And you get this. It's what? It's a quadratic equation, right, for ca. Not surprisingly. I mean, look up there. Okay. So just set this right-hand side equal to 0. Substitute all the parameter values. You get a quadratic equation. If you, if you simplify this, you'll get this, just algebra. Okay. So everyone knows how to solve that, I hope. It's a, it's a quadratic. So you plug it into the quadratic equation, and you get something that looks like this. Right? There's going to be two solutions for this. One is the concentration, steady state concentration is 1, whatever units you're using. I didn't specify. The other one is minus 2. Minus 2 doesn't make any sense. Right? So I mean, mathematically, it's true. But there can't, the concentration being negative makes no sense. So essentially, there's only one steady state, 1. That's it. So now that we found the steady state, now we want to linearize the right-hand side of this equation about the steady state. And to do that, you form this equation. It's just rewritten from the previous page. I called it y prime. Now I'm calling it ca prime. Otherwise, just the same equation. Okay? So you have to evaluate the function at ca bar. By definition, that's 0, because that's how you found ca bar to begin with. 
so that term's going to drop out. Then you have to be able to compute the derivative of the function with respect to CA, evaluate that at the steady state, and multiply that times CA prime. Okay? So, taking the derivative of this, I hope you, you agree is trivial, right? So this term will drop out, then you're going to get minus Q over V, and then you're going to get minus 4KCA. And when you evaluate that, it'll be minus 4KCA bar. And that's, all I've, uh, that's what I've evaluated here. Okay? So there's the minus CA, which evaluated CA bar, minus 2 and 2, right? Sorry about this. 1, 2 came from there. The other 2 came taking the derivative. That's the value of K right there. And then you have CA bar. And you know what CA bar is. It's 1. If you plug 1 in there, you get minus 3 for that whole thing in the bracket. So that's your approximation of the system, minus 3 CA prime. Okay? All right. So that's easy. No, <laughs> no problem there. All right? Now, typically, we might have more than one equation. Okay? And the long example I was going to do at the end has two equations, so let me just explain. This is a topic we're going to revisit a lot when you take the control class as seniors, so I feel okay about just glossing over it for now. I won't gloss over it on the exam, of course. I'm just kidding. Okay. I can guarantee you that I don't, you never know what to tell people because you're like, you want to reassure them, but you also want them to pay attention. There's some fear that helps people, right? If you fear this will be on the exam, you'll listen. If I tell you, you know what? This isn't, then it's all of a sudden, it's like, wait a minute, what's going on? Uh-oh. Okay. So um, I'll tell you at the end what I'm going to do about this. But here, let's say you just have two coupled differential equations. So I want to do the same thing as before, except instead of having a single differential equation, I have two of them. Okay? So one equation for y1, one equation for y2. In principle, the, left, the right hand side will depend both on y1 and y2 for both equations. The right hand side of that one's called f1, right hand side of this one's f2. All right, you want to find a steady state. Steady state means you set the two derivatives equal to zero. Two equations, two unknowns. Solve them for y1 and y2. If I gave you a problem like this on an exam, which I'll explain in a minute that I probably won't give you the one like this complexity, because reasons I'll explain, um, you, I would have to give you functions that are simple enough you could solve them by hand, right? That would be things like quadratic equations and things like that. If, if this was a real problem, you would use F solve or something like that to solve these two equations and two unknowns. Okay. So let's say you have the steady state in hand, and we're interested in linearizing this about one steady state that we found called y1 bar, y2 bar. Then you have to do a Taylor series expansion of both functions. Okay. Now the functions are functions of two variables, not functions of one variable. That means there's more terms in the Taylor series expansion. So first of all, you have the constant term, right? That's just the, f first of all, let's do, it. let's do the Taylor series expansion of that function. First of all, you evaluate that at the steady state. By definition, that's zero right there, okay? Then you're going to have one term involving a derivative of y1, another one involving a derivative of y2, because the function depends on y1 and y2. If the function depended on 10 variables, you get 10 derivatives, just the way it is, okay? All right. So we have this part here that's always going to evaluate to zero if we're doing this at a steady state, which we always will. You have the derivative of f1 respect to y1. Now partial derivatives actually make sense. Um, evaluate that at the steady state. That's a vector, right, y bar. It means the steady state value of y1 and y2. So when you, when you take this derivative, that's going to be another function. It's going to depend in principle on y1 and y2. You evaluate that at the steady state, you'll get a number, some number. Okay? Multiply that times y1 minus y1 prime, also no, sorry y1 minus y1 bar, also known as y1 prime, right? Do the same thing for y2. Now just take the uh, same function with respect to y2, multiply it to y2 minus y2 bar. So it's just like, just do, just do more of the same. Do the same thing you did for the first equation with the second equation. Evaluate the function of the steady state, that'll be zero. Take the two derivatives of the second function, multiply those by the appropriate terms here, okay? And when you're all done, you're going you're to find, obviously, these terms are zero, and these terms, these are some numbers, okay? And because I want to pose a matrix problem, I'm going to call the num this number A11, this one A12, this A21, and A22. This should not surprise you. That's going to be Y1 prime, Y2 prime, Y1 prime, Y2 prime. So there you get that, okay? And then, of course, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put this in a matrix because I like that, okay? And so I'm going to define a matrix, obviously, or vector, 
y prime that has these two components, and then I'm going to write these two scalar equations as a matrix equation. I always do that. No, no surprise there. Now you might say, what's this j thing? You might recall j is the de j is a matrix of partial derivatives, and so is a. So in this case, the a matrix you get by linearization is really that thing I defined to be the Jacobian matrix in the past, evaluated the steady state. I just threw that in here for your edification. Same thing. Okay. All right. And then um, in terms of the initial condition, you've been, you've seen this before. If I have initial condition for the original variable y. I want an initial condition for my new variables, y prime. I have to use the definition of what y is, right? Because I'm finding this y prime to be y minus y bar. It's now a vector instead of a scalar. So clearly, if I want the initial condition for y prime, I'm going to take the initial condition for y. This is what I normally am given in the problem statement. And then I'm going to subtract off the steady state to get the in initial condition for this, right? And many of you on the homework y you did um, where we used this, it wasn't linearization, but it was non-homogeneous equations, right? You'd find the steady state, and then you'd manipulate it to get a homogeneous equation. Many of you had trouble applying the initial conditions because you, you'd apply the initial conditions for y to the equation for y prime. It doesn't matter how you do it. Like, you can, you can apply the initial conditions for y to the equation for y or the initial conditions for y prime to the equation for y prime, but thou shalt not mix them up. Because if you do, you screw it up. I think it is written somewhere, that statement. But I'm going to check on that. All right. Um, so this is the last slide that I'm going to cover here. So let's say you do this. So you might say, why am I doing this? So right, this is what we're doing now. Just change this. So we take this nonlinear set of differential equations. We find the, st the steady states. About one steady state we linearize, and now we get a set of linear differential equations like this. Okay. And so here's my, here's my uh, claim, that I can look at the eigenvalues of this matrix A, just like I did the eigenvalues of that matrix A, check this kind of thing, and then I can conclude something about the stability, not only of this system, but the original system, right? You don't really care about this system. But the, the reason we're forming this is because I can look at, determine the stability of this linearized system and conclude something about the stability of the original nonlinear system, which is what I want. Right? OK. All right, and this slide says how you, well, this slide says how, <laughs> this slide, no, that one. OK. This slide says how you do it. OK? So here's what we're going to do, which I've already showed you. Here's the procedure. First of all, you're going to linearize you have to find the steady states to begin with, but once you have a steady state, you're going to linearize the nonlinear equations or nonlinear model, and you're going to get this A matrix here, right? This A matrix, basically a matrix of partial derivatives all evaluated the steady states. There, it's, a, it's a matrix of numbers, okay? You're going to compute the eigenvalues of that matrix, just like you did in the previous case. You're going to check the location of these eigenvalues. If all the eigenvalues have negative real part, then you're going to say the steady state's stable. If any of the eigenvalues have positive real part, the, the steady state will be unstable. And if any of the eigenvalues are on this axis, you can't conclude anything. You get it? So if all the eigenvalues are here, stable. If any of the eigenvalues are over here, unstable. If any of the eigenvalues are on the imaginary axis, no conclusion at all can be reached. All right? OK. Now. The devil is in the details, as they say here. You, so when I said stable, you'll see I've, I've, I've qualified that quite a bit here in the actual text. I call it locally asymptotically stable. So you might recall what asymptotically stable means. It means something like this. And let me just, let me just show an individual one variable makes it easier. So here's a variable versus time. Okay. Let's say this is the steady state of that. Okay. And let's say you you perturb the system away from there, like you start the system off with an initial condition that's not at the steady state. If you start at the steady state, it'll just be a straight line at the steady state, right? If it's a stable steady state, you're asking if it's asymptotically stable it means it comes back and goes directly to that point. Okay, that's to be contrasted with something like this. 
the, see this thing, this oscillatory limit cycle thing? That's stable because it's not growing without bound, but it's not asymptotically stable. It doesn't actually go to the steady state. Kind of goes, it's in between. It's in between unstable and sta uh, asymptotically stable. Okay. So we're saying it will, if the system has this property, it'll go back to the steady state. But you'll notice there's this local qualifier here. That, that didn't occur over here because it wasn't germane for that. Now the, steady, now the result is locally. And so what it means is you can perturb the system away from the steady state, but you're not guaranteed you can perturb it much. <laughs> so in other words, I'm guaranteed that I can, there's a small perturbation. I can move this steady, initial condition away from the steady state. It'll go back. But I don't know how far away it is. And when you don't know how far away things are, you call them local. It just means if it's small enough, it's fine. Okay. So you might say, who cares? <laughs> What's the implication of this? Well, the implication of this is if, if you were trying to operate a plant at this steady state and it was stable and it got perturbed away, it would want to go back there. That's, that's good because you want to be there. And if it gets perturbed away, it's going to have a tendency to want to go back there. That's good. In many, um, well, chemical reactors are the, cl are the classic case. But the, the most exciting case actually is jet fighters, you know. So if you're, the good news is if you're on an airliner that is a passenger airliner, those are built to be stable, right? Um, so in other words, they don't have a tendency to want to crash into the ground by themselves, which is reassuring. But high-performance jet aircraft are unsta un inherently unstable, okay? And when I was really young, I went to a workshop at Cal Berkeley, and they had a flight simulator, right? And they asked you to fly that it was impossible. You always crashed it into the ground. Of course, the way they do it in reality is they have a control system that operates the plane. You don't operate it because you can't do it. So the point is the systems that are inherently stable and steady states that are inherently stable are nice because the system's going to want to stably operate there and stay there. Okay? And if you have a system that's not stable and you want to operate at a point that's not stable, it's going to be a lot, of, lot more work and it's a lot riskier. Bad things can happen. And we'll talk a lot about that in control. Okay, so I covered all that. So these are a few caveats or additional comments down here, right? You might have more than one steady, um, steady state, and you also might have more than one um, stable steady state. You'd see that if you did a chemical reactor problem, which you will do. I hope, I hope you'll do that. Uh, when is that? That should be junior year, first semester? Yeah, maybe next fall. You guys take kinetics next fall, I think? <laughs> People are like, I don't know. I don't look that far ahead. All right. I was like, when students come in for advising, I'm like, I need, they come in with their sheet of paper, and I'm like, well, there's zero flexibility. They're like, I know. And I'm like, so what are you going to do? This? They go, yes. So I go, you want me to sign it? They're like, yes. And I sign it, and they leave, right? It's not like if you're in some, you know, some, I don't know, some li like liberal arts thing. What are you going to do? I don't know. I was thinking about taking art, you know. <laughs> so I'm not sure how I got off on that tangent, but anyway. <laughs> All right. Okay. So now you can have a system that's kind of interesting. It's like this. You can have systems where you have a stable steady state and you also have a stable oscillatory. It's called a limit cycle solution. So these can be stable and unstable as well as additional. We don't really talk about these because they take much more advanced methods to find. So you could have a system that if in a certain domain of operation wants to stably operate at a steady state and then another domain wants to oscillate like this. Okay, so that's called a periodic solution, and that can also be stable. Okay. And um, so then you might ask yourself, how do I know whether I'll reach that steady state or that steady state? And you, know, you also had this reactor problem, right, where you had three steady states. One was unstable, medium conversion, high conversion, low conversion were stable. How do you know which steady state you'll get to? It kind of depends which steady state you cl start close to, right? If you start close to a high temperature, you go to the high temperature steady state. You guys might have seen that when you did um, some of the work you've done. Okay. Now, what I was going to do, but I got a little bit behind, which is ironic because I, I was so far ahead earlier. But um, I was going to do this example, but this example takes a lot of detailed calculations, okay? So I can just tell you what the example was, and then I'll tell you what it means for me to be skipping it. So it was an example similar to what you did in the homework. And the idea was you go, we, went, we would go through, I'd give you the equation, you'd find the steady states, you'd check, there'd be two of them, you'd check the, do the linearization at both steady states, find the eigenvalues, and check the stability of both steady states. The steady states are the two ones you saw in the homework, the washout steady state and the so-called non-trivial steady state. 
but I decided that there's other stuff, given the limited amount of time we have, I'd rather cover. I'm going to cover this also in the control class. Okay. So I'd say, if you ask me what you really need to know about this, um, this is critical, right? And maybe the rudimentary stuff about this. But I'd have to get, like, you saw the first example I gave you? One equation, something of that, that complexity. This, this example is a hi higher level of complexity, so you don't need to know it to that degree. Let's just leave it at that. Okay. All right. So now I'm getting caught up. Okay, good. So now we have, um, so what have we done with differential equations so far? Well, we've done the following. First of all, w we hopefully, I'm not sure it's true, but I spent one lecture and gave you some homeworks and things like that on how to formulate them, right? That means writing the equation out. I think being able to write the differential equation is more important than being able to how to solve it. Because any, anybody can solve a differential equation. Uh, well, okay, maybe not anybody. I have, I have some children that can't solve them, for example. Um, don't really respect them, but anyway. Um, but the, the, the ability to formulate an equation is what makes chemical engineers special. If you give you know, someone in math an equation, they can solve it, but they can't write out mass and energy and momentum balances. So I think as you go through the curriculum, this is, like if someone asked me what, what's the single most important skill in a, a chemical engineer had, I would say write mass, energy, momentum balances. Okay? And so hopefully you're learning this in your other classes and this, you know, I'm putting an error here because I think in the long term this is the most important. We spent one lecture and other examples doing this, so obviously I'm not asking you to be an expert here, but. All right, so we did that. And then we said if we're lucky enough that the equation is linear like this, we learned how to solve it, right? You find the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of the equation, you come out with a solution. Okay, we learned how to do that. All right. And then we said, well, if the equation looks like this, uh, we don't know how to solve it, but we can at least check stability of steady states, right? And what I just taught you doesn't require you solve this equation, right? It just requires you linearize this function and then compute the eigenvalues of it. Okay, so, you know, formulating models, solving linear ones, checking the stability of linear and nonlinear models, okay? But what we haven't done is how to learn how to solve nonlinear models yet, okay? Um, I did jump forward and did this in MATLAB, right? We learned how to do this in MATLAB, and you just had a homework on it, right? So hopefully you know something about how to solve it in MATLAB. And I, I was hoping to do it <laughs> in a little bit different order. But now I'm going to talk about some of the methods that underlie the numerical techniques that are used in like MATLAB to solve these, okay? And the goal of doing this is not so you can write your own code or become an expert in numerical methods. It's to give you enough background that when you use methods, you understand what you're doing and you know when they'll work and when they won't work and what, what might be going on. Because to have um, no knowledge, of using computer-aided tools of which you have no knowledge of is not a good idea. It's kind of like Word, right? I don't know if you're like me, but I don't understand Word. Here's an example. You guys ever tried to place a figure in Word? And like you type one sentence and it pops the figure down to the last page. You're like, what's the algorithm that causes that to occur? Okay. And because I don't understand, I can't use Word to place figures because I don't know how Word works. Okay. Um, and so things like MATLAB and Aspen that you're going to use as a senior, which you probably unfortunately won't learn the details of, you should have some idea how they work so when things don't work out, you would know how to fix them. Right, without.